My name is Daniela. Um, I'm presenting joint work with Daria Tish, who I think is in the virtual audience out there. And we will be talking about the division of housework and perceptions of fairness today. So currently, most individuals agree that household labor should be shared. Uh, yet men continue to spend only half the time on household tasks as their female partners. And the disparity varies, but it exists in most countries, sadly. Uh, so why this disparity persist has been an extensively studied topic in sociology. And one of the most prominent explanations for this persistence is that couples justify this arrangement uh, by counterbalancing their partner's non-housework contributions. So for example, thinking if he brings more income, maybe he's out, he can do less housework, those type of arrangements. Um, however, this counterbalancing seems to operate differently for men and women. That said, uh, we know little about which contributions are perceived as legitimating these inequalities across the broader population and not only in couples. So in other words, um, when, are, when is household disparities perceived to be fair in the general population is something I think uh, we know less about. So in this study, we're gonna argue that examining widespread perceptions uh, of what constitutes a fair division of housework is important, uh, mainly because these norms um, reflect broader social constraints guiding individuals' housework allocations and also provide new understandings of the mechanisms driving the, the entrenchment of gender inequalities in household labor. So to answer this question, um, so our main research question is gonna be under what conditions do individuals consider unequal divisions of housework to be fair? Uh, and then are these conditions gendered? So to answer these two questions, we are gonna field a multifactorial survey experiment in, US, in the US and Germany. We haven't done this yet. So what I will be presenting right now is the design. And so we're super interested in your feedback uh, before we field the, the experiment in both countries. Uh, for the sake of time, what I'm gonna be doing here is going to present the focal uh, survey and not, I'm not gonna talk about the hypotheses about the comparison of the, of the two countries for now. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about our theoretical background and main hypotheses. So to generate our hypotheses, we're going to draw on two theoretical approaches. One is a distributive justice theory. Uh, so basically, this theory sustained that individuals perceived fairness results from the attribution of proportional rewards to contributions. Uh, so that means that in this experiment, we're gonna first assess if spouses' non-household contributions, such as earnings and work time, legitimize unequal household division. So basically, if I bring more income to my home or I work more hours, uh, is it just, do I earn the price of doing less housework? Uh, so to identify which non-household contributions may be important for fairness assessments, we're gonna draw on prior empirical work about couples and housework and what seems to be important uh, when they're deciding who does what and, and for what time. So um, this literature is huge. Uh, scholars have found that, uh, this is very general, but that spouses relative earnings and also the time spent in paid work impacts a division of household labor. Uh, so we're gonna examine if, hypo if this hypothetical spouses contributing with higher relative earnings or more time in paid work, for example, are more likely to be perceived as unfairly uh, overburdened with housework, basically doing too much housework. Um, so moreover, we are also gonna look at telecommuting. So qualitative research suggests that spouses' possibilities to telecommute or work at home also seems to shape housework allocations uh, because working from home has dramatically increased in recent years, especially due to COVID, uh, we're going to assess telecommuting here as a moderator of the effect of time spent in paid work on perceived fairness. And lastly, uh, housework, of course, is a domain where gender plays a huge role in shaping who primarily is perceived as being responsible for housework tasks. Um, therefore, we're going to expect that inputs, earnings, um, paid work, work time and so on, will have smaller effects on perceiving wives as overburned with housework uh, than in the case of husbands. So in a way, we're expecting a sort of discounting effect uh, when it comes for women. So their contributions kind of count less 
uh, when we're talking about uh, fairness and housework allocations. But of course, fairness is also in the eye of the beholder. So we're gonna draw from social comparison theory here, which basically sustains that individuals draw on multiple benchmarks to assess the fairness of a given distribution of resources. So in practice, this means that we're gonna examine specific respondent characteristics that might influence uh, their perceptions of fairness um, via those comparison processes. Um, so we're gonna focus on two characteristics. We're gonna examine the role of the respondent's own division of labor, uh, if they're in, in cohabitating or married. Um, so prior work has found um, that individuals tend to rely on intragender comparisons to assess the fairness of their own division of labor. So here we're gonna hypothesize that female respondents who execute a larger share of housework in their home will be more likely to perceive unequal housework arrangements for women as more fair. Uh, compared to respondents that have more egalitarian configurations in their own home. We don't make like a symmetrical hy hypothesis for the case of men and their own housework, just because there's like so little evidence. And so we prefer to remain agnostic about that. Um, so moreover, scholars have also found that individuals' gender ideology shapes uh, their view about housework arrangements. Uh, and so we're gonna expect that respondents who have more conservative gender ideologies will be less prone to perceive unequal divisions of labor for women as unfair. Okay, so now that I talked about the theory that our hypotheses, let's go to the experimental design. So uh, just an overview. So like I said, we're gonna propose a multifactorial vignette design. Uh, basically respondents are asked to read five different descriptions of hypothetical couples and their distribution of housework. So these vignettes systematically vary spouses' relative earnings, work time, uh, telecommuting, and also, like I said, the housework contribution in itself. The main outcome is gonna be to what extent the presented arrangement is perceived as fair or unfair by the respondent. So this table here includes the dimensions and levels of our experimental design. So we're gonna employ a full factorial design resulting in 135 vignettes. And we build 27 decks of five vignettes using a de-efficient blocking technique. So basically what this does is it's gonna just maximize orthogonality and it's gonna level balance within each deck. So let's look into the dimensions and the level. So let's start with relative earnings. So basically here we have three levels. We're gonna, in one level, the wife earns more than the husband per year. In the other level, uh, the husband earns more than the wife. And then both of them are gonna earn the same. So we follow the similar logic regarding relative working time and also telecommuting. Uh, in telecommuting, for example, one option is that the wife works two days per week from home. The other option is that the husband works two days per week from home or both work five days a week in the office. Then um, our last dimension is the relative housework uh, that uh, each spouse um, makes. Um, so here you can see we go like from extreme configurations to egalitarian configurations. So we start, for example, in a household where the wife only um, does two hours of housework versus a husband that does 18. Uh, and then that, that difference is shrinking and to an option where they both do the same. And then the other extreme is a case where the wife is uh, engaging in 18 hours of housework and husband does two hours of housework. And so I think a nice feature of the design here is to present a wide range of arrangements, maybe arrangements that are not that common in real life, but we think that theoretically they pose a sort of an, an interesting conundrum to respondents and to put themselves in these more extreme situations regarding the, the arrangement. Um, okay, so then the main, outcome here is, like I said, each respondent uh, is asked, how fair do you think the division of housework is for each spouse? Um, and then the respondents are going to be presented with an 11 point fairness scale for each partner. So, and this is adapted from a lot of work in fairness uh, and earnings, actually. Um, <clears throat> so you can see here, the scale goes from minus five, which means total housework for the focal spouse to zero, which is a, a scenario of fair, fair scenario, to plus five, which means this person is doing too much housework. Um, we pretested this scale to see if it was working properly. 
So 94% of our respondents answered that they had no difficulties in understanding the Furness scale. And also respondents use the whole range of, of, the, of the scale, which we think it's a, it's a good sign. Um, okay, so now I'm just basically gonna uh, go through the experiment, like each section of the experiment. Uh, and please uh, hold your thoughts and critiques because like we said, we're um, having fielded this yet. And so we're super interested in your thoughts. So the instructions are, I'm gonna just read them. Uh, so we would like to learn your thoughts about fair ways for couples to divide up housework. There are no right or wrong answers. In the survey, you will be introduced to five different hypothetical couples. After reading each vignette, please take a few moments to reflect on how fair you think the described situation is. We would like you to use numbers between minus five and plus five to represent your judgments about housework. Please use negative numbers to indicate if one of the spouses does unfairly too little housework. Use positive numbers to indicate that a given spouse does unfairly too much housework. Use zero to indicate the allocation of housework within the couples is perfectly fair. Okay, this is the vignette. So there's a lot going on here. Um, so what you see in bold is what we're randomizing. We, I forgot to say we're also randomizing the names of, of each spouse and also the order in which they appear. So, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna read it for you. So Anne and her, and her husband, Brett, have two children who are 13 and 10 years old. Anne works 40 hours per week and earns about 62,000 a year. Well, Brett works 40 hours per week and earns about 48,000 a year. Anne works from home two days and must go into the office three days, while Brett works five days per week at the office. Excluding childcare, Anne spends about six hours per week doing housework and Brett spends around 14 hours per week doing housework. Thinking about the overall burden of housework in this home, how fair do you think the division of housework is for each spouse? Note that housework hours exclude childcare tasks, which um, it's a key point that I, I will go back in later in the presentation. So as you can see then, the respondent has to um, assess the fairness for Anne and for Brett. And at first we had a design where we had only, we just randomized which of these two spouses we were going to evaluate. So for example, only Brett. But then we found actually the respond, responses were not symmetrical, so that this is why we decided to put to ask for both spouses in the in the vignette. Um, yeah, they, they read five of these. They can go back and, and change their answers. Um, and then the in, the instrument also involved, like I said, responded characteristics. So this one is a classic gender ideology question that we adapted from the International Social Survey Program. And then the other important respondent characteristics we're gonna vary here is like I said, the own division of labor of, of each uh, respondent. So here, if, if living with a spouse or partner, which of the following best applies to the sharing of household work between you and your spouse or partner? So then we have, you know, I do much more housework than my spouse partner. And then it goes, you know, up to, I do much less housework than my house, than my spouse um, or partner. So that is the design. Um, now we have issues that we need to resolve. And I think it's, it's gonna be super important for us to see what you think. So the first issue is childcare. So usually childcare is not conceived as housework uh, because childcare is supposed to be an activity that people may enjoy, whereas housework is not to. So in a lot of, in a lot of empirical research, sometimes these, these two dimensions are assessed separately. Uh, so what we did for now was to try to emphasize all the time, this is about housework and it, we're excluding childcare. We present this couples having two kids of kind of teenager years, um, but we still feel unsure about that if, if that's the best course of action. Um, so we foresee another option, which is just talk about childless couples and focus on housework among those. Uh, we will be, however, excluding an important universe of families. Um, so that's a trade-off. And then uh, another option would be to just tackle the childcare situation, randomize childcare hours uh, that each uh, 
for each partner and ask about the total division of labor. So housework and childcare. Um, yeah, so if you have thoughts about that, uh, that would be super useful. Um, and then the other big issue is cognitive load. So as you know, I just read that vignette, there's a lot of numbers and kind of figures in the vignette. So we're thinking, is there a way to kind of like simplify the vignette somehow? So for example, when we talk about the number of hours of housework, maybe we could talk about fractions that each uh, spouse um, kind of performs uh, or ratios. And the same thing happens, for example, with earnings. Uh, if there, is there a more intuitive way to convey um, those figures in the, in the vignette? Um, I think that will be very helpful. So I don't know how I'm doing in time, but uh, that, that, that is what I have uh, today. Um, yes, you got 10 minutes. So actually okay. uh, you could, yeah, you could use your 10 minutes. Okay, so, well, um, I could, I'm gonna show you then briefly um, how the fairness scale is behaving. This is gonna be a little bit counterintuitive because this is not controlling for anything in the experiment. This is just how the fairness scale is looking. Um, so, well, most important, I think this figure was reassuring for us to see because basically we see that fairness is varying according to the housework division in, in the home. Um, now it is what, so I'm just gonna, what does this mean? Um, so the negative ratings here are gonna indicate that the, the focal hypothetical spouse is underburdened in terms of housework, so doing too little. And positive coefficients or positive ratings indicate the spouse is being overburdened, so doing too much housework. So this is evident, for example, if we look at fairness for wife in um, this green bar here, so she's doing 18, hour, 18 hours uh, of housework while her, her husband is doing two hours of, of housework. So the, the fair, the, it's a very positive uh, rating. And so it basically saying that she's overburned doing too much uh, housework. And, um, and we, do, we see similar results actually for the case of men too. So for example, if you see this in fairness for husband, we have this blue bar here. Um, so the husband is doing 18 hours of work and the wife two hours of work. And so again, we see that this is perceived as highly, you know, the husband is doing too much work. So at least I think for us, this, is a, this was a nice thing to see. Like it seems that respondents are uh, kind of responding the way, the way, in, in a way that we expected to the furnace scale and the input of housework hours. Um, okay, I will stop with that because I really want to hear uh, people's thoughts and comments. And, and so I will stop my share. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Daniela. It was great. So uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the invitation and the uh, opportunity to discuss this uh, extended abstract. Uh, I need to say maybe it's not a, as we heard, it's a, a work in progress, so to say. Um, however, I can say there are many, many, many positives and strengths of the study design. Um, so overall, I would say this is already really convincing. Uh, obviously, it's a very relevant and important topic. It's a kind of classic, uh, not only privately at home, but also uh, <laughs> in the scientific community. I find the use of multifactorial survey experiments is well justified in that case, based on the extended abstract. Um, I believe the attribute factors um, are well justified and very clever, I think, that we use the full factorial and the blocking technique, but especially the full factorial because, um, yeah, it allows you to estimate later on all sorts of interaction effects. And these are typical troubles that uh, researchers have later. They discover or they wanted to look at certain interaction effects and then they realize are used for whatever main effects design or a design that only allows for particular interaction effects. So this is all um, very, very good. So in the following, I just have some comments on um, several levels. Uh, however, I need to say, um, I don't think here are any major issues. So these are not really things that you might want to consider or not want to consider. Um, so first of all, uh, but maybe not most important for today, um, by reading, and I'm aware it's an extended abstract, but um, at a conceptual level, uh, and I don't exclude my own work here. 
maybe it's good to think about and clarify what type of norm is measured here. Um, so is it a descriptive norm, objective norm? There are different norm typologies, uh, to my knowledge, in the um, social science literature, because often, um, again, I don't just with my own work, we mix up things there, fairness perceptions, beliefs, norms, so it would be good to think ahead and maybe uh, to think about what are exactly measuring there, and uh, in case it is a norm, what type of norm. Um, the hypothesis uh, are very plausible, um, but again, it's just an extended abstract. However, maybe you could keep in mind that they should, should be linked more closely to theoretical arguments in my view. Um, compared to uh, referring to you know, previous findings, um, I think it's good to um, make the theoretical uh, assumptions explicit uh, why we expect certain effects and not rely upfront on previous um, empirical findings to justify um, a hypothesis actually. Then, um, here I'm not sure myself the third one. So, um, first of all, in motivating the study, I think you can play the card um, that the multifactorial survey experiment should be able to lower socially desirability bias. And in your case, there might be a bias because somehow we all know how work is important to see that every day. And um, at least in the countries you're operating, I would suspect um, there are quite some, um, yeah norm prevalence in terms of gender equality. However, we know from observational data or revealed um, behavioral data that um, obviously the, the households, um, the house work is not shared equally. Um, however, so that can be something you could use to motivate, but it could be also something to think about in your own study. So you present multiple vignettes that's good, that makes the whole thing more efficient uh, from an experimental point of view. Um, I understand that you already collected some data. Uh, maybe you could reflect, I'm not recommending it, but just to think about it, um, that if social desirability plays a role here, then um, recent research, but also other studies has shown that the between subject design, right? Coming more on research on, uh, on discrimination, that if you present only one vignette per respondent, um, might actually be beneficial in terms of uh, lowering mm -hmm. this type of social desirability. Now, uh, why could it be important in your case? Again, I'm not sure, but uh, you present multiple vignettes. Um, respondents might be aware, of course, what is varied there, and they might spot, oh, that is how couples share their housework. And um, then it might, yeah, you might produce, so to say, um, a certain level of social desirability that we cannot directly measure mm. uh, from your data, that's clear. So I just want to make you aware that could be something uh, you could still underestimating or not capturing what's really going on because um, respondents look at these vignettes and still answer to some degree with a uh, certain level of social desirability. And then um, by reading the extended abstract, it's only a side comment. I was surprised that you don't refer to uh, related vignette studies. Um, we talk a lot about the just earnings literature. That makes sense, of course. But um, so when I saw the topic, I first had this study in mind, um, housework share between partners. You might be aware of it, a vignette study. Of course, they use a different setup, um, like in this study, um, the respondent actually um, should imagine himself or herself being in that situation. Also, they include your child care as one of the factors. Um, but just as a side comment, I think it would be good um, to maybe relate more to, like, to, to previous experiments, but also to see what exactly you do differently, or maybe still if you have time to learn from their experiences in case you are not aware of them. I'm just a um, side, side comment. Uh, that's another study that I found um, that seems to be rather close to what you are attempting uh, because, I uh, don't want to go into details here, because they actually present the uh, divisions of housework and um, respondents are asked to evaluate these divisions. Um, so in terms of distributive justice, if you're interested in that, that seems to be closer to your, to your own design. Um, However, that's uh, theory and how it relates to other studies. Um, 
regarding the experimental design and implementation, now I learned in your presentation um, two new aspects that you are really uh, especially interested in. First of all, um, that might be now very subjective. Um, so home ownership, I found it personally convincing and clever to take this as an indicator of wealth. However, I wonder um, how respondents understand that. So maybe if you do some cognitive pre-testing to get an idea, um, because I think all attributes are kind of clear and straightforward. But um, yeah, maybe it also helps you later on to, um, how shall I say, uh, justify your analysis to have some qualitative evidence how respondents actually understand this attribute um, in the context of your, your vignette, your particular vignette design. Um, then something that I'm not really understood why you do it is the next one, and you mentioned it in the presentation as well, um, that respondents can go back in your study now um, and change their answers in the vignettes. From a survey methodology point of view, uh, which might say, yeah, this is perfectly fine, of course, and uh, no misunderstanding, uh, respondents should have the possibility to not answer any of the vignettes, that's clear on a one-to-one -one basis, but to my knowledge, for any type of multifactorial survey experiment, I find it really unusual because uh, typically um, respondents are asked to, um, to evaluate these vignettes independently of each other, right? And if you give them the possibility to go back, or um, I would also maybe recommend um, to explicitly mention that in the instructions that they should evaluate this vignette independent of each other because, uh, but maybe others can correct me because to my knowledge, the idea is not that we compare here across vignettes. It's exactly the idea that each situation is eval evaluated on its own and then we look at the bigger picture. And this is, uh, yeah, in some type of literature, absolute standard, I would say, and it's very uncommon that respondents uh, have the possibility to go back and, and change their answers. Okay. Then, um, maybe I first comment a bit on your two comments that you made at the end. Uh, others might have uh, further uh, opinions. Um, I have to say, um, I found it quite convincing how you um, cope with the childcare issue. If it's not the main topic of your study, from my point of view, I found it quite convincing. I saw in the other vignette studies, uh, vignette study that I mentioned earlier, so uh, in social science research, that they have childcare explicitly as an attribute. But if it's not your main component on the literature, uh, it's discussed how, sh how shall I say, childcare separately from housework. And I can see this distinction. I think you are very convincing there. And um, from my point of view, cognitive load, um, that's an interesting one because the literature, the method literature to my knowledge suggests that surprisingly also to myself, uh, respondents can cope with a lot. Uh, so reading your vignettes, but also the actual, that you use the actual values, I, I would be surprised if this is overload. However, um, yeah, pretest might help to get an idea that, I don't know in your pretest study whether you included the question, which is often done, uh, how easy it was to understand the vignettes and, and to get an, an idea. But um, I mean, also from my point of view, if you consult method literature, you would see that um, your particular study does not suggest per se any issues with cognitive overload. But uh, I think the real test, the real good test would be uh, to, to do a pre-test actually. Now, um, as I said, I think it's kind of convincing, right? You, uh, you present different distributions, you're inter interested in distributive justice. Um, one minor issue, uh, maybe again, I'm wrong here, in relatively working time, I realize that for all attributes you aim to aim for the uh, same total, right? So 20 hours overall uh, housework time, relative earnings only with the working time, somehow both equal 80, but the others some up to 70. I don't know whether this is with intention or but it's a minor point. The bigger point might be you talk a lot, not a lot, but an extended abstract about the just earnings literature, right? And, um, 
using the justice framework and so on. Now there would be a possibility to actually adapt that more closely even from my point of view, um, meaning instead of um, presenting distributions, which is of course I understand more directly linked to the distributed justice literature because you, in, you include distributions as an actual attribute, um, why not, I'm not saying that I'm recommending it, but just maybe to think about um, similar to the just earnings literature to indeed take a focal person, present um, the, the hours of housework, have an additional attribute for the, um, for the partner to get the distributive justice aspect, um, then kind of the same where it's important with the other attributes and what is the advantage? In my point of view, the advantage is then you can calculate more directly gender ratios, which I believe you can also do on your data if you can compare, however, it's more straightforward. For instance, you could calculate the housework gap similar to the gender pay gap. Um, you could calculate um, welfare measures. So for instance, um, following um, life satisfaction approach that is uh, used in economic evaluation literature, you could um, calculate um, kind of marginal rate of substitutions between um, earnings income and housework time. So it gives you much more flexibility. And um, also if you would follow this type of design, um, you could typically include more levels for earnings. I mean, for housework, you do already. So it goes from two to 18. Um, but again, for the, um, if you later on analyze the data, um, it gives you more flexibility in what you can actually analyze. And that brings me to my last point. Um, for me, it was not clear, but it's not a criticism. But uh, based on the extended abstract, how you actually want to analyze your data, right? And it might be important for you to think about it because you want to include group comparison, you want to compare men and women and so on, and there might be issues in modeling, but just to think how you actually do the analysis, you might need to include many interaction terms in your model. How would it actually look like? How you specify the attributes currently, it's more um, categorical, the approach that I was referring to from the justice honest literature um, specifies many factors as kind of later on continuous variables that could make your life easier in analyzing the data. So maybe it would be good to think about it uh, if you then go a step further um, how you actually do the analysis and what you can get out of it. And now, while you're presenting, that's not the very last point. And I think it's also mentioned the extended abstract somewhere you might have the idea, but I'm not sure whether it's true or not, that um, let's say the same unit on the positive side that you do too much housework is the same value as one unit on the negative side that you do too little housework, but actually that might be following other type of theories in social science is not the case. And uh, you might um, think about this as well. So that the unit, the positive unit is valued less or more than the negative here. Okay, I hope my very few comments were not too unstructured. I can only repeat myself. Uh, this is really food for discussion. And um, in itself, if I look at this design, I would say kind of, you know, it's quite it is convincing. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy to discuss further. So feel free to contact me. I can also send the slides, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening.